to one more of us, part two. So part one was um, back at Oshkamp 2019. And this is kind of a follow up about what I've done since, but it will be, I'll, I'll recap the important bit, so it'll be self-contained. Um, so this is, this is a slide where I talk about myself, just to make sure I know how to use the slide advance button. But yeah, I'm Andy Bennett. Um, I've been involved in Oshkamp and Osh BCS for, oh, I don't know, 10 years now, maybe. Wow, I'm going to, um, and I'm going to talk about the one wire bus. So the one wire bus is this thing from Dallas Semiconductors, now Maxim, and you may be familiar with it in a variety of forms. So there's these one wire buttons, which hold some data. There's the little one wire thermometers, which a lot of people in the maker community are familiar with, the DSB, the DS18B20. Um, and you may have seen them in pubs sometimes, like just the, in that lady's right hand, you can see her putting the one wire button on the till to, to log into her checks or whatever she has on her till for her customers. So they use all over the place. Um, and on the previous slide, also you can see these little TO, what's that, TO Marathon 2? I'm going to test me on my knowledge of packages there. So they use, it's basically a bus that's useful on a PCB, but also for longer, longer runs off a PCB for connecting peripheral devices, normally memories or something kind of register based to a microcontroller. And as you saw earlier, Chris Swan used this um, one wire temperature probe in his, in his sous vide system. So I uh, probably recognize the sous vide there and some, some meat that he cooked with it. I've not put in it. I've been teasing Jeremy with food all evening. I ate my dinner at the early. Um, so what do I do with it? So a few years ago, I got involved with a, a little experimental anaerobic digester, and they have they had a cafe and they had an anaerobic digester, and they took waste from the cafe and they put it in the anaerobic digester where um, there's a biological reaction that basically turns waste food products, so any any kind of kitchen waste in or organic waste into um, methane, CO2, and fertilizer. And then they would put the fertilizer in. So, so this is a picture of the anaerobic digester. It's in that in that hut on the right, and it's all, all renewable. We've got some solar panels on the roof and stuff. Um, and then they put the fertilizer into polar tunnels where they grew lettuces and stuff. And they like they um, fertilized the lettuces with the fertilizer as well. Used the gas to heat the polar tunnels, and then um, you know harvested the lettuces and served them in the cafe. So they were kind of going for this closed closed loop thing, but this is it's quite a tough thing to do. You need quite a lot of monitoring and control. And so one of the things we were wanting to do was kind of uh, check the temperature of the polar tunnels and also check the temperature of the anaerobic digester. Because if, if you've got any, especially in the winter, if you've not insulated it from the ground properly, then it gets too cold and it, it stops working. Like the biological reaction needs to be 30 odd degrees to work really well. And if you kind of get it insulated well enough, it's self-sustaining. But if you put it on the ground when it's cold, then all the heat leaks away and your reaction stops. So we wanted to kind of litter these temperature probes all around and take some readings, making a big, a big um, data logging system with them. So this is your temperature probe. Um, and then Oshkamp, two years ago, I presented this, which was a little lash up of a, a line driver designed to basically allow you to build really big networks of these devices. So I, I did a prototype, I presented, I spent way too many slides that day as well, and presented how I basically got these buses to work. Up. So I tested them up to 670 meters, because I, I ran out of cable, I had about 670 meters of cable, and then I ran out, but managed to get these things working. So like half a dozen temperature probes on the end of a 670 meter long cable. And I, I was pretty happy at that point. So. That was my little that was my little driver that I built that can do that. And I built that out for that note from Maxim. And then the talk was hundreds and hundreds of slides of my oscilloscope about how I debugged it, how I got it working, how I used my oscilloscope to, to basically prove this electronics out and tweak it and adjust it and get it get it to work on really long wires. So the idea was that we could put these temperature probes all around the site and just have one device. Back in, the, back in the hut that we could log all of the different temperatures everywhere on. And so the next thing that I did 
immediately, really immediately after, like it seems, it seems like this might be a bit of a lockdown project, but actually it started immediately after Osh campaign in the winter of 2019. And I had a pretty good hardware design by about March 2020. And then I manufactured it at JLC PCB. And this is the picture of the board that came back. It was it wasn't my first keypad board. I've done I've done some talks in Osh before about the boards I made and extra home. Um, but this was the first really complicated board I did, first big board, first design that I just kind of went for in the schematic editor, got it all laid out. I chose enclosure for it, so you can see I've got the routed notches so that it fits in the enclosure nicely and um, crammed all my electronics on into the space available. And I thought I was near, near the end, and then I realized I had to reroute everything on a four, on four layers rather than two. So this is a, my first four layer board. And it's the first board that I've sent off to one of the kind of really accessible um, PCB manufacturing plants. So there's a load that are really accessible for everyone, but including makers and enthusiasts now. And so I sent this one off to JLC PCB. They manufactured it for me. They sent it back to me. Um, it was a really good experience. I'd recommend if you're interested, get a board made. It's good fun. I mean, it takes hours to do the CAD, but once you send it off and it comes back, it's really satisfying. So this is my board. Um, in, the, in the 3D viewer of KeyCAD. So KeyCAD is an open source PCB design tool. It's, um, it's pretty good now. I, I did a talk on it at Osho a few years ago and basically said um, it's only free if your time is worthless. But now it's got, they've really iterated it on. It's coming out of CERN and a few other places. They're taking it very seriously and they've done a really good job on it now. So um, I'm not super experienced with all of the high end stuff like Altium and ORCAD and all that stuff, but KeyCAD is definitely serving me well now give me what I need. Um, and so in this blue circle here, that's one of the little things you saw on the perf board earlier. So I took my line driver, put it into surface mount technology, and then I put eight of them on the board so that you can have eight 670 meter cables coming out, going off in different directions. Because the, this kind of bus pop like a kind of a network topology you put all the temperature sensors along one wire works really well if you've got one straight wire. If you've kind of got, if you fork the wire and split it, then you tend to get kind of reflections and, and the, the kind of the capacitance of the bus changes and impedance mismatches happen and the bus doesn't work very well. So I thought I'll put eight line drivers on, you can have eight different cables going out in different directions, and then you won't have to split the physical bus. So I put eight drivers on and they come out on these two RJ45 connectors on the front. And there's four buses on each RJ45 connector, and then there's two, two grounds and two power. So you can power your devices as well. And you get about half an amp of power on each connector at five volts. And then there's a little 80 mega 1284. So this is similar, very similar process to what goes into the Arduino. It's actually on the, um, there's a board called Arduino Goldilocks Analog, and it's the same processor that's on that. And it's the it's the AVR processor with the most amount of RAM. It's got 16K of RAM. It's got 128K of flash and 16K of RAM. So I thought I need the most amount of RAM possible, so I've got the biggest one. I ran out of bio pins. As you know, everyone who's ever done board layout will tell you, you always run out of bio pins. Um, and then I put on a USB, like one of the little FTDI USB connectors, um, bridges. I put on um, a an, an microchip ENC Ethernet controller, so it's just 10 base T, but it gives me Ethernet connection. I've got a little microchip um, LoRaWAN module, so that gives me um, 400 megahertz, 800 megahertz um, LoRaWAN bands. So I let, like so that the anaerobic digester we're working with is near Houston, and there's a LoRaWAN access point there. So I thought, you know, maybe we can try and try out some of the LoRaWAN stuff. And there's a real-time clock. So this is um, a real-time clock backed up by a supercapacitor. So you can program in the date and time, and then the supercapacitor can, keeps keeps the clock running even if you unplug it and move it around. So you've got some kind of assistance of date and time on, on the on the device as well. So you can do sensible logging. And then on the back, because I didn't have space anywhere else, there's an SD card slot for, um, I tested it up with up to a 32 gigabyte SD card slot. And they, I've written the, or ported the Petty FS, uh, non chance Petty FS back driver into the ADR for that. Um, 
So that's the main board itself that I've built. And then I realized that actually what we want to do is have more than just temperature sensors. So these temperature sensors are great, they're fully integrated. You give them, well, you give them data and ground. You can optionally give them power as well, but if you don't give them power, they will just parasitically power themselves off the data line and they just do their thing. But what if we wanted to put actuators? What if we wanted to put some kind of read switch on the door of the polar tunnel so that we know when people are going in and out or if someone leaves the door open and the temperature goes down in overnight or what if we wanted to um, have a level sensor for how much fertilizer we have in the tank or that kind of thing. So I also built this little one wire dev board and basically it's a development board designed to emulate the one wire device. So um, you basically get a stripped down version of the one wire driver that you saw before that's for device mode. You get the 80 tiny, this is a really nice chip, this is the new 80 tiny one series chip. So there's actually three different chips you can put on here. There's the two of the zero series and one of the one series chips. And these are, um, well, microchips now, new range of AVR microcontrollers, and they are really, really, really capable. So previously they've had the 80 tiny range, which has been tiny. They had the 80, um, 80 mega range, which has been the regular one that you find in Arduinos and that kind of thing. And they've had the 80 X mega, which has been kind of a bit bigger and had a lot more peripherals. This thing is basically the X mega peripherals, the really high end peripherals on the, um, in the 80 tiny package. So you get a bunch of UARTs and DACs, some ABCs, loads of IOs, loads of timers, um, and it's, it starts at 34p in units of one, and it's got loads of RAM, loads of flash. Yeah, so three of them per pound, a really good value. So if you haven't checked out that, I recommend it. The only slight hiccup is that it needs the UPDI, a UPDI programmer, but there's loads of tutorials online about how to make one of those with, a, with an existing Arduino. So you get one of those, and that you know plugs into the one wire bus and that emulates the one wire protocol for you. You get an optional power supply, so you can say, oh, I want I want bus power, I'll just take power from the one wire bus and I plug it in, or I'll fit in the top right here, I'll fit my own power supply. And if I need a bit more power for whatever electronics I put on the de development board area, you get nine IOs, so nominally split into analog and digital, but really any, any of them can be analog and any of them can be digital. So you can plug in UART, SPI, um, I squared C, um, analog comparators, analog to digital converters. Um, I think there's an analog reference output on there as well. And then just on the board, I put a footprint for a, a TRRS jack. So that's one of your um, kind of jack you get on combined headphones and microphone um, in your headphones. So it's got like the four connectors on it. So you can use that to plug in an external probe of some kind with up to four leads. So maybe you've got like a power and a ground and a data or an, or an ID or something that you want to plug in um, that actually kind of goes in your tank or whatever. And then you, you can build yourself a little analog circuit on in the prototyping area with an off amp or something and then feed it into the into the um, AT tiny and then those values will show up on the one wire bus just as a, as a generic sensor. And you can log it along with everything else. So we've been using these in the only area to just to basically bridge all of the sensors we have onto one wire. So we deploy a common one wire network throughout the, throughout the site, and then we just plug in sensors wherever we need them. And if we need to, you know, if we need a CO2 sensor, we get it off the shelf, we do a bit of prototype on the board, and then we put it onto the one wire bus. And then finally, I've built a bunch of breakouts as well. So there's a bunch of breakouts along the bottom for breaking out all of the, like I said there's eight one wire buses that they come out in two connectors, so you can break them out and inject more power where you need it. And then a few little prototyping boards for kind of bridging the bridging the DSD18, DS18B20 temperature sensors into the RJ45 standard. Um, and I've written a, um, started to write a manual, it's not a very good manual, but started to write a manual for it as well. So um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of show you that, show, show you what you can do. Um, Basically with open, open source tools, I designed it all in KiCad, I sent it off, it came back, I sold it up in my bedroom and then I, I tried it out and it was reasonably straightforward and reasonably successful. So I recommend giving it a go if you're interested. There's not very many barriers to doing that anyway, anymore. Okay, thank you Andy. Uh, thank you very much Andy. Um, that brings our evening to an end. Um, um, and 
Uh, thank you all for our speakers, and I hope those of you listening have enjoyed the talks. They will all appear, uh, thanks to Julian's uh, video wizardry on YouTube in the next day or two. Um, so um, with that, with five minutes to spare before they come and hurl us out of the building here, um, we'll we've got four minutes for questions then, and then we have to be out of the building. Any questions for Andy? What did you use for documentation, um, Andy, for putting the... My, my manual, I wrote that in LibreOffice Writer. I just thought, oh, I, I should pick a tool chain, and I thought, no, I'll just write the stuff down first, and then <laughs> I'll try and do that sort of stuff, I'll worry about a tool later. It's the first time I've used a word processor in about a decade. It was really odd. Uh, looks like a question coming from Richard. No, so JLCPC do now have a um, an assembly service, and when I first started, it was limited to a subset of their catalogue. Over the past year, they've really expanded it. So I haven't looked to see if they could assemble this for me, but I didn't ask them to. I assembled it at home, and the reason for that was I just didn't really know what I was doing. I kind of wanted to assemble it myself in case I messed anything up. And also because, like, especially the first one, I wanted to assemble it in bits so I could test test first the power supply and then add bits on and make sure that it was all working as I went, rather than just assemble the whole thing and then wonder why nothing worked. So yeah, I didn't I didn't ask them to do that. Um, but if I did a, a I just did a run of five boards. So if if I did another run, I might ask them to do. I might look into trying to work out how to do that. And um, so these are individually hand soldered components. What do you have on? Yeah, so the first one that I've got with me tonight actually hand soldered with tweezers and a and a um and a soldering iron, just like so I wanted to build up each bit, each like subsystem in turn. Then I did a kind of side project where I had an old clothes iron. Um and I thought, oh, can I turn this into a temperature controlled PID um solder, soldering plate? And the answer is yes, you can. And the subsequent ones I've soldered up all together on that. 